All right, six o'clock. Um, we'll go ahead and call this one to order. Um, this is the regular June meeting of USD 417 Board of Education. Um, in lieu of introductions tonight, I think we all know each other. Um, I think Mr. Doty would like to say something. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Powell. I, I asked Terry if I could have a moment here in the beginning um, just to say a few words. You've all heard me say before that words matter, and I truly believe that, especially when it's my words that are said. Um, I also believe that if I make a mistake, I have an obligation to, to address that mistake and own it and correct it to the best of my ability. And I also believe that if that mistake wrongs somebody, that I need to make that right to the best of my ability. So that being said, I, I apologize privately, but I also think I owe a public apology to Micah Dornbos. Um, at the last board meeting, we were talking about um, the, covering the GMBC meetings. I made, made some comments that I by no means meant to be belittling or undermining, but uh, reflecting back on that, I see how they came across that way. So I want to apologize publicly to her and everyone else who heard those comments because there was a lot more context to that. Um, and I should have not even said anything in a public meeting, wait till afterwards and said something to her privately. So I want to apologize to her and everyone else for that, those comments, because they were not meant to be belittling or undermining by any means, but I definitely own the fact that they came across that way. Um, in fact, I, I want to tell her and everyone else how much I appreciate the fact of what she brings, the value she brings to our team um, and what she does for the success of our school district. You know, she onboards all of our new employees. She deals with our accounts payable receivable. She is a huge help to me when it's come to making projections for things like negotiations and so forth. Um, she's really good at spreadsheets and, and helping uh, aggregate the data out of after funds and those things. Um, she does a ton of state reporting and federal reporting for us. Um, and then the list goes on and on and on. So I just wanted her to know and everyone know how much she's valued on our team. And I want to apologize for those comments. So, yeah. Thank you. All right, we'll move on then to the consent agenda. And the consent agenda tonight is the approval of the agenda. Approve the minutes of previous meetings, financial report, pay bills, donations and gifts, approval of the family engagement policies, 2022-2023 meal prices, 2022-2023 supplementals, and then some personnel items, employment of Emily Summer, Council of Elementary School Aid Interventionist, Brogan Humphrey, Junior Senior High School Aid, Junior High Assistant Football Coach, Milo Butler, High School Assistant Softball Coach, Tina MacGyver, High School Scholars Bowl Co-Sponsor, Gracie Nelson, Junior High Cheerleading Co-Sponsor, Emily Renter, Junior High Head Girls Basketball Coach, Amy Finch, Junior High Assistant Girls Basketball Coach, Brianna Humphrey, Junior High Cheerleading Co-Sponsor, and some resignations, April Winninger, Council of Elementary School Aid Interventionist, Addison Bakura, seven hour cook, Tyler Sisson, high school assistant baseball coach, Milo Butler, high, uh, junior high assistant girls basketball coach. Anything there anyone would like to see removed from the consent agenda? Mr. President, I move we approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Move the second that we accept the consent agenda as presented. Discussion on that item. All favor, raise your right hand. All opposed? Um, I guess I will. We didn't do introductions, but Kelsey and Ari and Micah are joining us on this. One. So, sorry, I didn't mention that earlier um, for those in the room with their backs to them. Um, moving on, then we'll go to the patron forum. Um, don't see anybody. Did we have anybody online? Okay. Moving right past that, then we'll go to reports. Um, I'll throw it out there. Anybody have anything to add? I know it's summertime. Mr. McDiffitt, your last one. You got been privileged. Appreciate it. It's a two-way street. Um, Mr. Doty. Oh, Bryce, you got anything? Yeah. Mr. Doty. Well, the only thing I have is just uh, be aware we'll be the building, the new house bill, the building's needs assessment that has to be completed now by each building before we you can adopt a budget. Then we'll have to take a look at those things first. Um, that always guides based where we allocate our funds as far as professional development curriculum and those types of things as well. But it just has to be more official now. It has to be in a document that each building will do. I'll populate that to a document that you will look at as a board. They'll take in accounts of state assessment data, um, projections on um, when students could be at grade level and so forth, which we're working on how to, to navigate those without putting hard deadlines and things that we probably can't keep. Uh, there's a good analogy by um, Someone yesterday on a Zoom meeting about that's so like asking a doctor when 100% of your patients will be healthy. I mean, that's impossible to, to determine from a doctor's point of view. So we're working on some of those things as, um, at an organizational level, um, but we'll probably have um, the needs assessment ready to start looking at 
at the July meeting after the building hasn't had a chance to compile their data. This year it comes becomes law in January or July, so we'll have to get it done, but it won't be done to the extent it will be able to be done during the course of the whole year. We'll have more time to have you know, site councils can give input on through their buildings and other other aspects that can be taken into account. So it'll be more of a fluid document. I, I think it's a really good opportunity for us to be able to tell our story, so to speak, um, especially from a legislative standpoint about what are some of the challenges we face in public education. Um, and this will help us bring some of that to more of a narrative locally from district to district across the state as these things are being looked at at a local level and at a state level and at a legislative level. So we have to do that though before it'll be different this year as compared to the previous years when we've done budget for you haven't had to look at those before we approve a budget. So same process will take place just in a piece of it. Okay. Board members. <laughs> All right. Moving on into discussion items, KSB recommended policy update. So Bryce has got a we've got a list. <laughs> You've got the list. There's a lot of policies. Um, unless <coughs> He's got he's going to kind of go through it and I'll we'll tag team it, but he's going to kind of lead the discussion. If you have other questions, if we skip over one, definitely ask. He can put it up on the screen and, and do a side by side comparison if we need to be. But there's some on here that we just need to adopt, and there's some we don't. And so Bryce, when I went through the day, he's made some notes on things um, that he's going to share with you now. Yeah, 30, 30 some policy changes um, that they're recommending. A lot of them are just are technical. Some of them are. Uh, driven by the legislature. Um, there are five or so that we're recommending uh, not to adopt, um, either because it hasn't been our past practice, um, because we're a smaller district, or because um, our handbooks cover what the policy is recommending. And the, the first of those is GCIA, which is on uh, the third page of the summaries. Uh, and it's the evaluation of coaches and sponsors. Our coaches handbook takes care of that. The one right after that, GCRG leaves, same thing. Our handbooks take care of leave policy. So just to clarify everything before that, it's <clears throat> recommended to adopt. Those would be the first ones we come to where we're recommending not to adopt those two. So if you have questions on ones before <clears throat> that, don't hesitate to ask. Um, <clears throat> The next one is uh, IF textbooks, instructional materials, and media centers. We uh, did not adopt the 04 and 07 revisions. I wasn't here. I don't recall why we didn't do that, but um, we do recommend that we adopt this one. Our policy is already pretty similar to what they're recommending, and um, the one see the one change they made is is that that's the one where they changed it to where it can't just be any person that challenges a textbook or material it has to be a parent guardian a student somebody that actually has skin in the game um, and then the next one is right after that iia performance-based credit we've never adopted that <clears throat> but but it had Revisions in 02, 04, 07, and last year, and we've never adopted it. Um, we're recommending that you adopt it to be in compliance with the state law that goes into effect July 1st. Um, the one after that, IIBGB online learning opportunities. We recommend not to adopt it. We've never adopted that before, and we're not required to by, uh, by any new law. It had revisions in 02, 04, 07, and 12 that we passed up. Um, and we do it anyhow. So this is just the online learning opportunity. So, you know, the high school has always had the practice of is if a student had an online opportunity for Butler County or uh, Edgenuity or any other institution that may offer it, um, Jill and them, they work together to work that in schedule. So we do it anyhow. I don't, I'm not for sure what the advantage of having this policy would, would give us. You know. Yeah, and there's a similar one later where it, you don't need the policy to tie your hands because we we already practice it. Um, JCAC interrogation and investigations is uh, on the next page of summary. Um, and we have to adopt that. They made it a requirement that uh, district staff, administrators, or super 
superintendent um, are required to meet with law enforcement on a regular basis to um, it's 38 to, <clears throat> to uh, review like reporting practices for any criminal behavior that might have happened in the school or um, just anything that should be reported to law enforcement. How do we do that? What's the process? And then it, uh, it added language for um, abuse. when when neglect and abuse can be withheld from the parents. Um, so basically, it makes it a law we can't contact a parent. If there's an allegation of neglect or abuse that's reported, now it's against the, this would be against the policy to contact that parent and say, hey, we had to call DCF because of the, the statement your child made today. So now it'll be up to the authorities to contact that parent if they kind of remove them from school or interview them at school. <clears throat> Just to protect the safety of the child. Um, the next one is JGFF, student transportation. Minor revisions. I don't know why we didn't adopt the 2013 revision that they recommended. Uh, but we do recommend adopting this one. And then the last one is KGA use of district personal property and equipment. There was a revision last year that we recommended not adopting, and three prior to that that we didn't adopt. Um, one of those things where we're a small enough district that we don't need to tie our hands with policy. We know what's going on with personal property and we don't need a formal process to request the use of property, district property. Uh, were there any that you wanted to pull up side by side? And I know it, so there was a lot of material even outside of these. We're not asking you to approve them until next month. So I can pull something up now or in the meantime, if you're looking at them. And Probably one of the largest policy revisions. Yes, yeah, since mm -hmm. I've been here. I've seen so a lot, a lot of to digest. The reason that that's happening is because there was an attorney that worked at KSB that was in charge of doing policy. That role has now shifted um, to another individual, and she is going through every single policy and doing um, the online and um, technology policy updates for districts. So she's finding these old antiquated policies that are sitting out there that have words like shall versus may we're not using the words they so a lot of those changes are going to be coming up so um, she did a really thorough job this year for ksb there'll be more <laughs> 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 Great. There'll be more. Good reading. so just to clarify though this is being presented tonight if anybody does have questions over the next month bring them up we can pull them off we can talk about it change whatever but they will be on there for an action item next month but, so okay. on, the, on the consent agenda i'll note which policies we're, we're wanting to exclude from adoption okay. all right anything else on the policy updates at this time COVID 19 operational guidelines so the admin team met today and discussed this with dana uh, basically uh, this is basically state recommendations uh, moving into the next school year. And I guess in a nutshell, what this would say is nothing is mandatory. This is all just recommended. And so we do not have any matrix or parameters we're going by locally. Um, it would be state using state data or CDC data, and it still would not be a mandate. It would be just recommendations. So if we had an outbreak- Mr. Doty, the isolation stuff on there would be yeah so okay yeah thanks for, so i'm talking about masking sorry on the first one um so there would be no masking mandates it would just be individuals who choose to wear a mask could you know, if they want to um and then the rest of the test that stay the screening and all that would be the same we offer that option for parents because quarantining it is still a communicable disease and so um the back pet the back side of the first heading were isolations and quarantine measures that would be where um, Dana and her health team, if someone is identified positive in school, depending on all the matrices that they could fall under, uh, um, would have to possibly quarantine at home for that guideline that's listed here. Uh, with still the test to stay and participate at options um, if, they, if they choose to do that. So this is just a draft. Um, she has a conference in July. We're hoping to get some more feedback and data 
before school starts. Um, so this is just a draft to start the discussion, uh, a draft to look at, and then we'll update it um, and put something on the July meeting, probably for um, a further discussion. Then we'll have a final draft in August meeting because our school board meeting in August happens before school starts. So any questions on this for Daniel or myself or anyone else? Well, but just adding, they are tomorrow and the next day reviewing the pediatric, the young. So by the time we get to school year, I expect those kids six months and older would be eligible to be vaccinated if they so chose. So some of that could change. Yeah, so we would take that. If, right. if by the time school starts, they can't, we would take it off. But we just left it because it says on there. Um, until they're eligible right. before that. So, um, yeah, if I just had somebody ask me about that, and I don't think it's going to be an issue because I ex fully expect them to approve it and move forward, but we'll see what happens. Great. A lot of um, what the state was talking about for next year is about those layered strategies, and that's how I kind of worded this draft, you know, just to start our conversations. I thought it was very good. But yeah, we'll, there's lots of discussion to be had and see what happens this summer too. So, so maybe that's just an, an FYI, keep in the loop that there's conversations going on and uh, we'll have something more formal to present to you next month and then something finalized in August. So let's keep the discussion going. If you have any questions or, or concerns, make sure to reach out and visit with us. Okay. Questions on that today? All right. Thank you for all that work. Um, no, those things aren't easy. Um, all right, moving on to the first action item. This will be a, an exciting one. <laughs> KSB Workers Comp Fund Member Participation Agreement. I'm guessing our costs are not going down. Um, no. In fact, we so they go, and Bryce can explain this better probably, but they go by a threshold for points. So if you're under one, level one and under, it's a certain amount. And once you go over level one, it's another amount. Well, we went over level one we had several significant claims so that our price jumped about twenty thousand dollars that accurate mm -hmm. so it went from twenty some thousand to forty some thousand so our work mm -hmm. insurance just almost doubled not quite yeah it's that experience modification factor there um you see it on the i guess it's the, the quote um that shows the the premium for each year and it, we're at 1.1 now we were at 0.9 last year um and that's just basically the number of um injuries payable injuries that you experience per year it's like per year payroll and number of employees and um we've been hovering below that 1.0 threshold which means we're having fewer accidents than we're expected to and now we're just over it so it can adjust that yeah. um, is what it is. As of all insurances, we hate to write the bill for pay to check for it. We have to have it. Too. These, um, you know, these injuries that that we experience, they're they're not something that uh, you can send out a safety video every month and address. It's just as a free, free, unavoidable occurrence. I think all of ours were unavoidable accidents that were unforeseeable. Yeah. So, is what it is. Just glad everybody's okay. Yeah. All right, questions on that? And are we part of the Loyalty program? Yeah, we started yeah. that yeah. Okay. We just need a approval for that. You really don't have an option. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, I will move we approve the annual renewal of the KSB Workers' Compensation Fund member participation agreement of the accompanying premium payment and loyalty credit program agreement. Moved and second that we approve the KSB Workers' Comp Agreement. <laughs> Special on that item. All in favor, raise your right hand. All opposed? Um, another one that I anticipate being less money than expected, a replacement bid for cooling systems at CGES. Yeah, so this one is an insurance claim. This, the windstorm we had in December, 
um, blew over some rooftop units that we didn't know about until we turned them on. And so uh, there was some damage done to them. And so we had a supplemental claim turned back in for December. So we do have to pay an additional $10,000 deductible on it. So, but um, it's about $30,000 worth of work. So I mean, it is what it is. But uh, this will be an insurance claim to replace, I believe, three or four rooftop units at Council Grove Elementary School. That blew over the windstorm. And the good news is that they were old units that were going to be need replaced in the future, near future, anyhow. So you're either going to spend it now on a deductible or spend it later in full price. Do you see the motion? I do. Okay. Um, I'm getting to it here. Um, Mr. President, um, oh gosh, I don't even know what I say next. I would like, yeah. Um, I propose that we approve the bid to replace three HVA systems at CGHS that were damaged in the windstorm on December 15th, 2021. So, at the elementary school? Did I say that? You said CGHS. Oh, ES. Sorry, ES. I'll second. All right, moving second, we uh, accept the bid to replace the HVAC systems at CGES um, that were damaged. Discussion on that item? All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed? Before we go to the next item, can I then ask, you know, Alpha Vista was supposed to receive some extreme winds with that storm of the weekend. Have we checked the roof and the systems up there? To... Yeah, they're roof, they don't have rooftop units, so they're all they set outside. So the, what happened over here is when we did the roof rotation and put the new um, roof on the first part of, of the elementary school, those units are sitting on, they're only cooling units because they, they're not heater units as well because they, they have a, a steam heat system over there. So they're just cooling units. So that's why it says cooling system there. But um, they're on blocks. They didn't penetrate. They didn't bolt into the roof. They didn't want to create a penetration point. So the blocks weren't big enough to keep the tip point from happening. So we'll address that when we install the new ones. So, but yeah. All right, anything else on that? All right, moving on then to the 2022-2023 academic calendar. So a minor change here, it was brought up um, by the high school that October 14th is homecoming. And that is our day of early release for the, for the grading period of PD um, as negotiated. So the high school proposed to move it to the 17th to Monday and do a late start instead of early release. So we can still get that negotiated time in, PD in, but not be out of school on homecoming. That's would be a mess for them to try to navigate that water with all the activities that go on that day. So that's just the change there. So we're basically trading a Friday afternoon for a Monday morning, correct? Okay, correct. And we'll make special. Yeah. That's what we wanted to do of that. now so we could send it out to parents so they can start planning if they need child care. So we know. Yep. Yep. Thoughts on that? Mr. President, I move we approve the change to the 2022-2023 academic calendar. Second that we approve the uh, change to the 2022-2023 academic calendar. <laughs> Discussion on that item. All in favor raise your right hand. Then the MHIT grants. This is mental health intervention team grant. Um, this is a really quick turnaround time, so I apologize. Um, it didn't open up until May 19th, which was after our last board meeting, but it closed Friday before our next board meeting. So that's why I kind of sent it out to you as a heads up. Um, we don't have to accept it if we are awarded it, but I wanted to get it in. What this grant does, if you recall a few years ago, they started a mental health pilot program in the state of Kansas where a few schools were selected to be part of a pilot program where they were given funds to employ what they call a school liaison. Um, so it's not a mental health interventionist in the building or a licensed therapist in the building for Crosswinds. It's a partnership with our mental health provider in this area, which would be Crosswinds. Um, and the school liaison position then helps facilitate um, that partnership with Crosswinds helps as part of our behavior intervention team so they can help with interventions on site. Um, they help schedule the interventions with Crosswinds to help keep kids in school instead of leaving the building to go do something more scheduled, more here on site to reduce the time they're out of the building. Um, there's, there's a whole list of things, essentially a sample job description that I kind of put together. I just pulled, pulled data out of the, the program guide from the state of Kansas to make that job description with. We can tweak that based on our interventions that we already have in place and how our system works, but they pretty much pretty well align. Um, 
so I, I applied for the grant and I needed to, to um, there's a whole bunch of wording in here. And this is just agreements between Crosswood and us and some statistics on how, what the need is for um, and why we need this program and, and how we would use it and the agreement between us and Crosswinds. Uh, the needs request is where it impacts us. As a school district, it's a 75-25 grant. So the state would pay 75%. As a district, we would pay 25%. So I had to put in some numbers to, to ask for the grant. So what I did was there was a certain staff member that kind of came to mind um, that was working on a counseling degree that we all thought would be a perfect role for this position if they were interested in it. So and to, to figure for the money, I just used that salary. So everybody, whoever would be in this position would be just like a normal counselor. They would go into our salary schedule just like a counselor would with 10 extended contract days. So it's not a, um, it's not a salary that we set that's outside the scope of our negotiating agreement, the salary schedule for licensed staff. So, that, so that's how that number comes about. So the states, and then of course benefits are in that. And so the total cost would be just under $60,000. Our match would be just under $15,000. And then there's another 25% the state pays um, that then goes to crosswinds for the services they provide in that partnership, for the time for the mental health therapist and so forth. In case of course. So it's a good, a lot of, a lot of um, Harrington was part of the original pilot program. While well, Bunsen's been in the program for several years now, a lot of good feedback from the districts that have been part of the pilot program and, and those who are now in the program and how it has helped facilitate some of the needs in the mental health and social emotional learning era a realm that's been vital to the school district. Questions on this? I'm only thinking how long the grant is. Is it one? How many years? Yeah, one? It's one year. Okay. Yeah. So it's been renewed every year. So we're hoping, especially with the current climate that we're in and the need for mental health and social emotional needs of our students and staff that has just become more prevalent than after the pandemic, especially. But this continues to get funded. It's kind of like the pre-K pilot program. Uh, to my knowledge, um, they've reduced it a little bit, but they haven't cut people out. So once you're in, you kind of keep getting funded. They may reduce the amount, but they haven't cut anybody out. I'm hoping this will be very similar to that. Once you get into it, they, uh, as long as the funding is still allocated by KSD or the legislature, they, they don't cut schools out there. They continue to add as funding exists. But that would be the nice thing about uh, also not hiring outside is if this does go away and not fund again, we can transition uh, someone back to a, a licensed classroom position and not have to displace somebody. When did they announce? They haven't told us when they announced it yet. I'm assuming it's going to be put sooner than later because it's late in the year to start hiring people. Mm -hmm. So tonight we need a, a motion to, uh, I mean, we've already applied. Right. This would be a motion to accept the grant if awarded. If award, yeah. So basically approve approve the application and <clears throat> to accept it if um, we're awarded the grant so we can move, on, move forward about have to wait another month to get pieces in place. Okay. Thoughts on this? I so move. <laughs> I've been moved and seconded that we accept the application and the award if so presented for the MHIT grant. Discussion on that item? All in favor, raise your right hand. All opposed? All right. Um, the next one would be the Safe and Secure Schools grant. So, same thing. This opened up at the same time. So, again, apologize for the quick turnaround. Um, this opened up on the 19th and is now. Um, was due Friday as well. So I reached out to, um, a while back before the grant opened up, I reached out to the city and asked them if there would be a possibility of some sort of partnership with them. This is a 50-50 matching grant. Um, so basically it's one-to-one. -one. And um, they're very, very well received. And, and, and kudos to our, our county sheriff's department and our city police department for the, for the partnerships that we have with them because they've been very vital in the relationships that we have and so that we're very much appreciative of that and there's a lot of crossover with them too they, they share a lot of officers a lot of officers that are police officers also employed by the county and vice versa so so it makes sense uh, to develop that partnership even further 
So part of the grant um, is, is finding measurable outcomes. And we, again, we can tweak this to our needs, um, but to have a starting point for an overview, um, I put together some of those bullet points that I shared. Um, basically it's in this grant, this application I can put up on the screen, but it's really hard to, for some reason this Excel spreadsheet's not as user-friendly as the other one. Let me share the screen. Um, it's hard to decipher some of it. The cells are locked differently. But so first of all, um, as far as the project summary, this is uh, looking at the partnership with the city, which I did go to the city council meeting and they did approve this if our board approves it and we do receive the grant. So that's one step completed in, in this process. Uh, but basically it's, it wouldn't cost us anything and it wouldn't cost the city anything financially. It just is opportunity cost to the city. It's what, what we've asked for is to have them assign an officer to the school district during our school day for the 189 school days plus um, 12 additional contract days for planning and training purposes. So if you put that to a dollars and cents amount, that comes out to be about um, with benefits and payroll taxes about $53,000. So half of that is uh, 26,000 some dollars. And that's what we would get reimbursed from the state, which then we would turn around and in some sort of MOU or contractual agreement, pay that to the city. So financially, they would actually be getting reimbursed half of an officer's um, expense, but they lose one officer who'd be out patrolling during that rotation as well. So it wouldn't cost them anything, but it is an opportunity cost for the city as far as personnel goes. And it wouldn't cost us anything financially because we would get the matching piece of the grant for the state that we would turn over to the city. Uh, so we would work out um, logistics for the city. Like uh, if they needed, they had a crisis or emergency, they could they could call that officer out to do something, especially since that would be one less officer invitation. So we would work out those parameters so they make sure um, they're they're covered in a crisis situation as well. But this person would primarily, we haven't even dove into the weeds on this yet, um, but we would develop an, some sort of MOU, memorandum of understanding with the city about, they would be basically assigned to the school district. They would probably be stationed at the high school, um, junior high, but they would serve all the other two buildings as well. So they would spend time in each building. Um, part of the, um, the outcomes for this grant, as you can see here, it's, it's really hard to see here, but um, minimize this. Number one, we want the SRO to investigate you know, allegations of criminal incidents per police department policies and procedures. So it would help with when we have an incident of, of a criminal activity taking place, they're already on site and helping with that investigation from a police side and a school side. Um, we provide law enforcement and police services to school and school grounds. So have a presence outside in our building, outside, you know, whether playground, walking around, whether it's outside here patrolling or something just to establish a presence for deterring criminal activity as well. Um, enforce state and local laws and ordinances, make appropriate referrals to juvenile authorities and other governmental agencies. So they work closely with us on that as you know, kids get taken into an intake possibly on how that looks and what it looks like and what services uh, from an educational standpoint we can try to meet for that student in whatever situation they're in. And work to prevent juvenile delinquency through close contact and positive relationships with students. And to me, that's the biggest one of all of these is building a bridge to sometimes some of our families have a negative um, association with law enforcement. And so the students then come to school and they get association with law enforcement. So this would help build some bridges maybe just so we can associate a positive association with law enforcement and that they're a resource because sometimes they, they have to do their job and, and deal with people who break the law. But they're also a resource for our kids to have in their life in a positive measure, not just looking at it from a negative lens. Um, Monitor crime statistics and work with local patrol officers and students together to design crime prevention programs. So working with our student body to take pride in our, our campuses and, and get student input and student voice on what, what would the adults do maybe to help negate some criminal activity or, or delinquency that happens mm -hmm. potentially. And eight, establish and maintain a close partnership with school administration in order to provide a safe school environment. So again, building relationships and maybe deter some uh, mischief that may happen. Uh, nine, assist school officials with their efforts to enforce Board of Education policies and procedures. Ten, ensure school administrators' safety by being present during school searches, which may involve weapons, controlled substances, or in cases that a student's emotional state may be at risk. 
uh, three assist school administrators in emergency crisis planning and building security matters. Uh, 12 provide course of training for school personnel in handling crisis situations. And 13 help to develop a standardized response to all hazards response plan in cooperation with local emergency responders. So just be a conduit to help facilitate. And with a new bill that came out with monthly or regular meetings with law enforcement, this person would probably I foresee leading that committee and leading those conversations and helping schedule those and so forth as well, and being that conduit between the, all the agencies. So are they employed by and accountable to the school district and the law enforcement? Yes. So that conversation we talked about a little bit, Nick and Sean and I talked. I mean, there would have to be some training. There's some school resource officer training that we'd want to send them to that we would pay for. I wouldn't expect the city to do that. We would pay for that. It's minimal, but it is necessary because we would do things differently sometimes than how an officer would do them on the street, right? So if an officer sees a crime on the street, probably gonna handle that differently than how if something happens in the school system. Um, so there needs to be some training and understanding about, yes, when they're in the building, we, we look through a school and educational lens and not maybe how we would handle the situation on the street lens. So it would probably be a combination of both. They'd still be employed by this. The, the way this would be set up, they'd be employed by the city because we'd be contracting them for, for the money side of things, for the purposes of financial reasons, and reimburse them contractually for a signing officer here. But we want to develop an MOU so everybody's on the same page about how would that officer and work with us and handle situations when they're in the school building in a school setting. It's kind of like the co-op is the best way I can describe it. You know, all of our special ed employees work are employed by employee school district because they are the sponsor of our co-op, but they're assigned to us and they work for us. So they follow our policies and procedures, but they go by employees negotiated agreement, if that makes sense. It's kind of that same similar setup. And for this one, you just kind of need a, a similar thing, you know, approval of the application and accepting the, the grant if awarded. Yep. And so this will be the same officer since they'll have to go under specialized training and then they could build a rapport with kids. Yeah. Versus sure. Trying to trade them out. Yeah. They're, Sean, Sean doesn't think it'd be realistic to say just one based on scheduling, but it would be a, a, a small identified, maybe two of groups or maybe you know no more than probably three officers are signed that are trained that go to this training so because he didn't want to tie his hands only one because of the holidays and time off and have they work in multiple four agencies it may be impossible to have the same person all 186 days or 189 days of school which makes sense and i understand that so but yes it wouldn't be just hey today you're going and today you're going it would be a, a a small identified pool of officers who are interested because we want officers who are interested in doing it too we want them to be want to be part of this as much as we want them to be part of it. And Sean's already said he's had several reach out and say they would love to be part of this. So I think the interest in, in is there, yeah, it, it, I don't, one I think would be hard to do, but a small group and all of them receive the same training. Well, there are privacy benefits to kids if it's not the same one all the time too, you know what I mean? Yeah. We don't all connect the same. So there might be an advantage there of a new face or a different face sometimes. Yeah. Especially if maybe something happened outside of school, yeah, it's a little just, de escalation yeah. time. And, yeah. 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 Thoughts, questions, comments, concerns? Mr. President, I move we approve the Safe and Secure Schools grant should we receive funding. I know that we uh, approve the safe and secure, secure schools grant if selected. Discussion on that item? Raise your right hand. Opposed? All right, next one is the Bloodborne Pathogens Exposure Control Plan. This is uh, just an annual approval, and then the data has to yeah, have. Yeah, it's just a review. The When I was reviewing the plan um, in the last couple of weeks, it was mainly just like we still have Family Health Center written in there. So updating that to Sam Morris County Hospital Medical Clinic. And the only other change, there was a couple wording changes in there, but um, on the consent form for hepatitis B vaccines that just updated, you know, whether or not they're getting a two vaccine series or a three vaccine series, because that's newer that we have not updated that form yet. So it was just updating those things. 
there wasn't any changes as far as who qualified for the, you know, certain things or whatever. And motion that we approve the updates to USD 417's exposure control plan for board board pathogens. A second. Moved and seconded that we approve the board board pathogens. Okay. Question on this item? All those in favor, raise your right hand. All opposed? All right, next we've got an executive session for personnel. Do we expect any action? out of these executive sessions. Okay. So I guess you guys don't have to stick around. Just for different again, thank you. Sir. <clears throat> Should we get him standing all the way out? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Murray. Mr. Oh, President, Bryce is oh, Bryce here got to go out. Yeah, I move we go into an executive oh. session to discuss an individual employee's performance pursuant to non elected personnel exemption under coma for five minutes with Mr. Doty and the board. So, those at home, I'll, I'll stop the live stream, but we won't come back to what we ask them for you. Oh, sorry, second. <laughs> Move to say we have a five-minute executive session with the board and Mr. Doty for personnel. Discussion on that item. 